uh, survey wouldn't be possible without the Estonian Center for Eastern Partnership. Now I would like to invite the President of Estonian Republic, Madam Kersti Kaljulaid. You're welcome. Dear journalists, happy to be here. And uh, we all know that 21st century is the era of communication. It's here. Communication is everything, and uh, absolutely everything is communication. Frankly speaking, it may be new to human beings, but I have a degree in natural sciences, and there everything's been communication all the time. You know that some uh, insects, they sting. The others never would sting you, but they have exactly the, the same color scheme. So they are communicating you, attention, I might sting. And that is kind of true news. Some of these bright insects, they sting, and some don't, which is false news. So you see, nothing's new. Human being has never created anything what nature cannot create. I think it's a very good starting point. But anyway, communication has always been there since the early stages of evolution and um, it's never been uh, just for us humans so visibly powerful, easily and quickly escalated and uh, so well or badly used uh, for manipulation of masses among human beings. Somebody tweets and billions may be lost on financial markets. Somebody makes a chicken move on a song contest and the uh, next day, you know, hundreds of millions do the same. Or, for example, tomorrow I'm going to Eastern Ukraine to a war zone. Practical use of it is, well, I think quite modest. But we hope to send rather a strong signal to people of Ukraine as well as people of Europe. It's poor power of communication. It doesn't only matter what you say. I've said the same things I'm going to say tomorrow numerous times in numerous capitals, including your capital, but it's also important where to say. I think there's no point giving you a lecture on importance of communication, and if you need it, there's my good friend Raul who can give it to you. I mean, I'm not a specialist, he is. Neither about the role of independent media. If you need it, you probably wouldn't be here. But you know the importance of it, and you have also gone through the study Mr. Ebana has presented just prior to me, at least that was, I was told that that was what he was doing. Luckily he's nodding. But I would shortly like to open up a bit uh, my view, and the view Estonian administration uh, in general has, on the measures and questions of information war. Yes, it's a war, or to be exact, information may be used as a weapon. There must not even be a war to use information as a weapon. Often we just sense it. Sometimes earlier, just as something strange pops up. Sometimes we can only understand from a retrospective that we were had, that somebody had manipulated the audience. It's like using doping in sports. Often that's the case that everybody knows, but until you are caught, you can compete. The survey Mr. Ebana has presented is like an anti-doping lab. Thanks to this survey, we now see concrete proof. We have facts and we have analysis. We don't have to rely on a hazy feeling and we see the patterns. This helps us to understand much better how Russian propaganda works. We can see that Russian media is ideologically controlled with very few exceptions. You can see also other patterns. Of course, I think you know of the bronze soldier case from 2007 in Tallinn and what happened 2008 in Georgia and 2014 in Ukraine. Or latest cases from the elections in US and France. Or are these different patterns? We don't think so anymore. We think it forms a part of the same pattern. All these cases had a strong STRATCOM element in them. The question is how to counter STRATCOM and hostile propaganda attacks. What is really good? When it happened in Georgia or when it happened um, previously in Estonia and when it is happening in Ukraine, people in the West thought that well, maybe it's a paranoia or maybe we really are as bad as we're told we are. Well, when it starts to happen in France and the United States, kind of changes the perception. 
so we have to be grateful sometimes for the global global reach of these kind of attacks probably would have still been much more effective in the interest sphere if they had not spread outside of the interest sphere. But luckily, this has been the case. We don't have to explain anymore that hybrid is a risk, that uh, disrupting democracies is a risk. Everybody understands it now that it is. Responding to blatant lies and rebutting false charges is important, but uh, it is of course not enough because well, as a common saying goes, the lie has done seven rounds around the globe before the truth gets the pants on to follow it. Hostile influence operations will only fail when publics understand them for what they are. And best response of democratic governments is to defend the ability of accurate information to circulate freely. It is important to support media diversity think tank landscape and to encourage cooperation between think tanks, governments and uh, media, just like it is here today ongoing. It is important not to respond to propaganda with counter-propaganda because after all, whether it's white or black, this depends on your standing point or your viewpoint. Propaganda is propaganda. Good propaganda is propaganda and bad as such because it's propaganda. It doesn't matter which side does it. We have only one advantage in this war, and this is not to respond with counter-propaganda. Even if we do, don't in some cases, there's still something which we need to convince our people about, that what we are saying is balanced. And we need long track records for that. So, Independent media outlets need long track records of not doing propaganda and doing it balanced. Public broadcasters need the same long track records. We know that it's painful sometimes because you may lack the audience if you are boringly balanced and if you do not peddle all kind of false news. And sometimes we even don't think how we can actually risk our reputation for example, in Estonia, sometimes state media gets quite esoteric. There are radio programs about, uh, I don't know, astrology and crystals and how positive effects, I don't know, all kind of this chakra businesses could have on people and so on. And Estonians are not laughing in the audience, no. I mean, this is something which takes away from the trustfulness of the public media. Simply because, I mean, a rational person knows this is not news, this is not the information even. So you may think it's harmless, but it isn't harmless, it's harmful. If it's meant to be real journalism, fact-checking, balanced information, then it has to be on every step. It cannot be that you are not doing the same in some program and then you're doing the same in the other program. We also have in Estonia a very interesting debate about um, Russian media outlets which are doing propaganda. Some politicians are adamant that we should buy our own programs in these channels and tell our viewpoint, maybe in a balanced way, but maybe also in an anti-propaganda way. But, I mean, if you buy time in these media outlets, then how should a simple person distinguish between the information you are providing and the propaganda they're getting from that channel. That's why I'm adamant that if we really want to fight with this kind of propaganda media outlets, we should have absolutely nothing doing with them. We could give interviews to them, but always knowing that, I mean, we risk to be also uh, presented the way we don't like to be. Sometimes we even have to take this risk because a politician cannot refuse to give interviews to certain media outlets. I would never refuse. I, I do give interviews to media outlets who also take big part of their program from, uh, from uh, First Russian China, have to. But I think we shouldn't buy our own programs in them. Not even if they are completely unrelated to political debate. For example, we had an interesting debate about uh, should, you, should you buy some customer information advertisements in these channels. For example, that it would be best if you equipped your house with uh, some fire detection devices. Who could be against buying advertisement in the channel which is widely watched in a country about fire detection devices? But precisely this, you shouldn't do it. People cannot distinguish, it's for us to distinguish. 
Of course, the other problem with anti-propaganda is that um, you cannot overshout. It's really hard to overshout. Every time you turn the volume to the max, the other side just brings bigger speakers. The only thing we can have, therefore, is trust. Trust of our people and the trust which, as I said, we must earn. It's the only strategic advantage we have and which can be effective in the long run. And this trust could be built both by private and uh, public enterprises. I wouldn't want to distinguish it this way, that public good, private bad. We have examples from uh, different factors, equally good and equally bad. It doesn't depend on the ownership. It depends on management and uh, what is the professional pride of the journalists who are working on a particular media outlet. It takes you years to earn the trust and one occasion to lose it. So. Uh, it's a very tricky business and I very much appreciate that it is hard to do. But every society needs these channels where people know they can get trusted information. And again, as I tell to our national broadcaster, don't worry, you don't have to be the most popular channel in Estonia, but I need you to be the most trusted. So that the people know that if something seems weird, then they will turn on to your news in this evening and look at your news program because they know if things really seem weird, then these programs will counteract these weird impressions. And at the very first moments, these channels, for some reason, who have built this trust, go on a slippery road of counter-propaganda and add propaganda to their ammunition. This advantage is gone and you start from zero, if not negative, because having betrayed the trust of the people, you have to start from deeper minus. Going propaganda does not widen your possibilities, but it actually narrows them. Although in the short term, they may seem as an easy shorthand uh, solution, and very often you hear this, that we don't have time to explain, we need to restrict access to propaganda. We don't have time to explain, we need to do anti-propaganda. I don't think that even short term this is a useful tactic. We have to expose the false facts and uh, uncover the fake stories and uh, we have to point a finger on trolls, but we cannot answer the same. I think trolling industry is something we could do much more to expose and discuss of and we're not talking that much about uh, this free commentary which you can find underneath all articles and the main reason we don't is because it's a huge pot of mud and none of us likes to go through it. But if any of you ever bothered, you will see very quickly a pattern evolving. In Estonia, for example, under my own articles, I can see the themes. One is that um, uh, has been away from the country a long time, alien, stupid because young women, young women, rich, therefore not close to people. And it comes after, under every, basically, theme. So you can see that whichever you talk about, you get these comments. Some of them are common. A party elects a new female chairman. What do I read? Young, therefore incompetent. Daughter of an important father, therefore has had it easy. Doesn't know re nothing of a real life. And, uh, and uh, simple people, third, has been away from Estonia, yes, for three years in the European Parliament, which doesn't mean being away. So you see, the trolls don't even create new themes. They also reuse the same themes. And we learn them if we read them. If we don't read, sorry, we don't learn it. And I think we need to teach our people to find also these trolling themes. It's relatively simple. I mean, in a one month, you get really adept in spotting trolls. And then you start reading in other international outlets and you see the same themes emerging there. And it's weird, I mean, there's probably only maybe 20 main arguments which is being used against liberal democratic politicians all over the world. Not so complicated to understand. Yet people find it, well, ugly to read, so they don't. And, uh, and they don't learn about it. We should. Because knowledge and awareness is always backed by facts, and only if you know the facts there can be the solutions. It may feel like fist fighting one hand tied behind your back, but this is the way we can be successful in the end. If you run away with your methods to the other side, you're lost and gone forever. 
and I don't think any of us wants to be in that position. So I think, as far as journalists go, build your reputation, this is your gold, the only value you really have in long term. And I think society should really think how to financially reward honest, old-fashioned journalism. This discussion is now starting and getting more earnest, and I hope it will not come down to the fact that then the public sector needs to support journalism. I think part of the problem, which was the uh, eroding of the income base for journalism by uh, social media and internet development, partially created by the journals themselves because content was free originally. Part of the problem, Netflix and other services which have made people to, well, get used to pay also for the internet content could actually help to regain some ground and some, uh, some resources for this sector. I think we should all be ready to pay for the old-fashioned thing that the journalist prints after having checked the facts twice and then once more. Because even if right now the news are free, they are quite often not worth much more than gossip because fact-checking is delegated to me. I mean, I don't really mind checking on a plane myself, but I do mind having to do my own fact-checking. I'm ready to pay for the journalists to do my fact-checking for me. And I'm afraid that uh, more and more this discussion also needs to go in this commercial direction because this is as it is, revenues is needed in order to do the necessary, which costs you real money to do the fact-checking again. Otherwise it cannot function, you cannot have it all, you cannot have it free, good quality and sustainably so. And I think you cannot really blame that um, this new dynamics in our media sphere has been used by those who uh, think they can turn the rules-based law to the interest-based, uh, the world to interest-based uh, space. Because after all, as I started from evolution and uh, just natural sciences, this has always been like this, but this should be something where we as humankind are distinguished. We have human rights, we have humanism. The bees don't, and the wasps don't, and the insects who behave like there were bees and wasps, they don't have neither. We should have human beings after all. Thank you for listening, and I could also take some questions if you so have. I don't know what the organizers have planned, but I'm ready to answer the questions. Thank you so much. Yes, we planned some questions. And <laughs> Thank you so much for your words. Um, they are very important for, for Ukraine and for Ukrainians. It's very important for us to know that we have a friend and partner who shares our values and our vision. And now let us shift to the interactive communication. We'll be grateful for your questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for, uh, for coming, for attending our event. Uh, what mass media do you use to keep uh, uh, informed about uh, uh, events in Ukraine and in the east of Ukraine and Donbass? Um, and uh, uh, we know that, uh, that Estonia is a big supporter of uh, Donbass and delivers a lot of aid to it, but recently we read that the European Union had allocated 900,000 euros for um, uh, hotels uh, for the peace. Uh, they are honest and transparent people and they report back to us uh, about the money use. Uh, on the other hand, I've been an auditor for a long time and I know that distributing resources in war zone is not to be measured with the gold standard of public expenditure, which is uh, up to 2% of the error rate. It might be considerably higher sometimes, but it is important that the aid reaches people. So uh, indeed, if there is uh, corruption, people should be caught and prosecuted. On the other hand, we shouldn't demand in the crisis situation the financial management quality and the uh, paperwork, which, uh, which is normally demanded from public sector. Uh, it has to be a separate standard sometimes. 
Uh, my information comes from Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and their, uh, their overviews and also the press briefs they put together. I'm not uh, following uh, Ukrainian media, I cannot read Ukrainian language. Uh, I do of course read also uh, in French and English and in German but mostly for the impressions, for the facts I rely on our services. Uh, uh, newspaper Provincia from Donbass. Uh, uh, I would ask you, upon your trip to Donbass, would you please share your opinion about Donbass and, moreover, announce that uh, uh, Donbass is the best producer of salt, of champagne, wines and the best music. No factual basis to state all that. Uh, good afternoon, Madam uh, uh, the President, and I'm uh, from Chernomorets newspaper in the uh, east of Ukraine. Uh, we received a lot of attention from uh, not so big country from Estonia, but you are so friendly to Ukraine. I understand that your visit is uh, um, not maybe uh, official, uh, is an informal visit maybe. Mm. And during this informal visit, uh, you have chosen uh, to visit Ukraine. Why, why you have chosen Ukraine for your visit? Uh, and the second question, uh, looking at uh, uh, Estonia's history, as far as we understand, you have a big part of Russian-speaking population in Estonia. Mm, uh, how do you um, uh, uh, tackle this issue of Russian-speaking population? How do you manage to uh, cover the news uh, for this part of population? How do you, do you prevent and propaganda among them? Uh, first question, uh, I'm here in Ukraine because we believe that visiting Ukraine we can help uh, both in the reform process of Ukraine to encourage your political uh, class uh, to uh, speed up the reforms. We can uh, remind our Western partners and allies of the situation in uh, Eastern Ukraine and uh, the humanitarian situation surrounding the war region. And I also believe that uh, our countries can economically cooperate uh, quite a lot as they are already doing, but we need to rebuild some lost trust from the previous times. That's why I'm in Ukraine. Uh, people speaking different language in Estonia is not an issue. It's a fact of life. All, all countries nowadays have uh, different people from different language background. It's a normal thing to have. It's very important to tell to our people who originate from Russian-speaking families that I don't think that speaking Russian means speaking Putin. And I can tell you that telling this in BBC after Salisbury brought me quite a lot of thanks from Russian-speaking people globally. Because they sometimes sense that if I'm a Russian I must speak Putin. In Estonia you never should make this error. Our people whichever background they have, and Russian speaking of course doesn't mean Russian, you can be Ukrainian, you can be uh, a Tatar person, Chechens, Azerbaijani, whomever. They also enjoy, enjoy their civil liberties and democratic rights. Of course they also enjoy their higher living standards, but this is secondary. In Estonia it's fine if you say I think Crimea belongs to Russia. I would not agree with you, but I would not prosecute or fire you because of that. And this is the way we go. And this has always been the way we go because, you know, Estonian Declaration of Independence 1918, first se sentence says, to all nations of Estonia. I always remember this while talking about different with di people with different language backgrounds in Estonia. To all nations of Estonia. We've always had many nations. They all have their equal rights. We have a single official language, which is Estonian. But we don't insist that everybody at home, let's say, forgets their culture. Why should they?
this is how we deal with it. And with propaganda, as I said, we put out balanced views. Sometimes people who have emigrated from Russia to Estonia, they even ask that, I mean, why on earth do you allow people to present the Putin position in Estonian national Russian language broadcast? Precisely because of that, we'll also present the other views, and people can then decide for themselves what they believe in. We believe that freedom and democracy wins, and if we stop believing it, we could pack up and go, because small countries have only one interest in the world, rules, laws of democracy. Madam the President, Vicernia uh, Odessa uh, newspaper, I'm uh, editor in chief. In Odessa, uh, in Estonia, we ha you have Narva, which could be slightly compared to the east of Ukraine. And recently, I've heard that a twin city of Narva is Donetsk. Uh, uh, my question, and also I read somewhere that you wanted for one month temporarily impose your government administration to Narva to experience what, what's going there. Is it true? Uh. Estonia is a parliamentary democracy and, uh, and it's a separate institution. Government is a separate institution. Narva is a normal post-industrial town, as is Thionville in France, Arlon in Belgium, many towns. But people of Narva tend sometimes to think that they are post-Soviet, and this is something special what they are going through. Loss of industry and uh, therefore stagnation of economy. And we need to show them that this is not the case, that they are normal towns, struggling indeed compared to the capital, but who, who isn't? So uh, we have taken a conscious decision to talk more to people in Narva in a focused way. And spending a few weeks there, if I'm there, lots of people have to come there, ambassadors have to come there to present their uh, credentials to me. They have to go, come to Narva. I will have a lunch with the EU ambassadors, which is a regular, regular event. They will come to Narva. And this is not because these people have never been to Narva, but because Narva people have not seen that we do take notice of their worries and problems. Why haven't we? Well, actually, I think we had. But there has been, well, lack of resources. We are gradually only growing up. And if you look at Narva, it's not the poorest region in Estonia. In fact, it's, it's, it has, uh, it's right in the mean. If you look at the Estonian counties, then Itavirumaa, where Narva is situated, is an average income region. But Narva people don't see it, because indeed they communicate less with the rest of Estonia, and even worse, the rest of Estonia communi communicates less with Narva. I'm trying to change this. I want to change perceptions on people living in Tallinn and those living in Narva. But I'm doing the same for other counties in Estonia. I worked, uh, well, a week from Otepa, a tiny town in South Estonia. I worked a week from Tartu, second biggest town in Estonia. Nobody noticed, but since there has been this perception that is Narva next, this me going to Narva is noticed. And you know we've turned it around. Narva is next European culture capital 2024. This will put Narva fully in the picture as a normal post-industrial suffering town in Europe. I think it will help. Катерина Майборда, Запоріжжя, сайт 061.ua. Катерина Майборда, 61TV channel from Запоріжжя. Do you know about the manipulations of Russian TV and uh, knowing about such manipulations, whether you would agree for interview with one of such TV channels? And what, would you and what would you say to them? Interviews for his channels, I don't fully trust not to manipulate. Because sometimes you have to put up this. And frankly speaking, if you look at the uh, online media, which is not with Russian bias, it can quite often also miscite you 
take things out of context, merge answers to two different questions. It can happen everywhere when you talk to the media. You just have to be aware of that as a politician. But I wouldn't say that in no case I would not talk to any media outlets. I would talk to media outlets. Of course, well, I don't have time to talk to 100% of those who make demands, so probably for one uh, these kind of channels there will now be 91 uh, saying that I'm wrong, I didn't give them an interview. Sorry, I cannot give interview to everyone, but I'm not refusing based on political bias. Uh, Baturin from her son, Novy Day newspaper. In case uh, uh, when one of the EU uh, laws uh, conflicts with the Estonian legislation, what would you do? Whether you had such cases and whether you rejected to follow the EU legislation if it uh, was not in favor of Estonian interests? First of all, EU agrees on laws which all member states are able to support. And hence it's only a theoretical question that there might be something which is going straight against uh, our position or our constitution. On the other hand, joining the European Union itself was against our constitution. We had to change the constitution for that. So we did. We voted for it. We organized an honest referendum. And we joined. We had a very open debate about it. We had one of the lowest support levels for joining the European Union. Only Malta in 2004 joined on uh, lower support levels than Estonia. But since we've kept and continued our honest and open debate about the European Union, also when we have to overtake directives and, and change our own law because we are applying European directive, as we have agreed all together in Europe, the debate is open public and democratic. This is extremely important. Uh, the Mainty Bielich Politichna Hersonshina newspaper. Uh, my question is as follows. Estonia for us is a, a good example in e-governance, in e-voting. Uh, and now when we hear a lot about mingling into uh, elections, uh, about uh, um, uh, uh, some negative things which happened uh, uh, in this area, whether you have changed your opinion about e-governance and its positive effects? Pen technology or digital technology, they are neutral to all kinds of meddling. You can go behind the voting box before people enter, give them $10 and don't with pen on the paper they vote the way you ask them. Electronic voting system is more protected because you can change your vote afterwards so it doesn't really make any sense to pay anybody $10 for them to vote because they will sell their vote second time and third time vote how they wanted to vote anyway. So you see, you have to compare the alternatives. Remember that technology is neutral to human behavior. And then make this clear that while technology is not 100% safe, it's at least safer than the analog alternative. That's what we do. But of course, when you talk about e-voting, this should not be the first electronic service implemented in any country. It should be the last. The first one should be something really low risk, registering children to kindergarten, for example. Something really troublesome, paying taxes, tax declarations something people really hate to do, queuing long time for social support and services, neighbors seeing that you are asking for social support. Go online with these first and only then follow with the high trust demand services like e-voting. Then people know already that they can trust the system, they have tried it million times and it has worked million times and it has not leaked million times. And then in addition you have to convince outside community, which for us is the trickiest part, because many communities have tried systems they call e-voting, but they are not all the same. And if somebody's voting system fails, then they think all electronic elements are bad. Ours has never failed us. Nobody can detect how I voted from our system. It's open to hacking, but nobody has managed. Yet I know that the doubts will always be there. On the other hand, I have a colleague 
in Europe whose votes had to be redone because the envelopes people sent their votes in were melting. So paper is not safer. Digital is safer probably. And absolute safety, well, there is taxes and death, nothing else. Ксения Килибердахер, Суон Сити. Ксения from Херсон Сити. Эстония had passed its path of reforms, which were tough and not very popular. Uh, uh, how did you tackle the problem of uh, counteraction to reforms, if there were any? Estonia had passed its uh, path of reforms, which were tough and unpopular, you, uh, while Ukraine is at the beginning of its reform path. What uh, uh, reforms was the most tough for Estonia, and uh, what did you do uh, convincing people that tough reforms should be done? Average salary when we regained independence was around $30 per month, as far as we can compare the statistics of that time. There was nothing to lose. We didn't have access to Soviet Union market anymore. And as soon as we started growing, we passed the acceptable price level for the former Eastern market, Russian market, and the countries linked to it. So our people, together with our government, saw no other option than to radically liberalize the economy have absolutely free market, create the tax system which was proportionate and did not punish people for earning more, which allowed freely the investment to flow into the country and to prosper without being heavily taxed because we really, really needed capital and technology to change the country. Our economy started growing very quickly, but to this day, we are falling behind as far as social services are concerned. Yes, they have developed and they are times better than they were in the beginning of the 90s. But we strive constantly to now make up also in these softer spheres of life. And we know we are 37th country globally as far as richness goes, GDP per capita. But I think we haven't recognized that being such a rich country brings us social obligations, and I'm right-leaning politician, but I still say so. We have a lot of work to do to support the handicapped people, their abilities in our society to work, equal opportunities to all. We have a lot of work to do. We are not a society which is ready, but frankly, I don't know of any society which is ready. There are a few grounding principles. Education, healthcare, and social system, good or bad, they have to be equally good or equally bad to all Estonian citizens, never mind how rich they are or how poor they are. Our school system is really good. And if I am, for example, earning the minimum wage and living in a rural area in Estonia, my child still has a chance to graduate from secondary school, which is good enough to go to any university and mingle with the children of politicians and uh, business people. This guarantees that we have social mobility, but this also guarantees that people always have hope. Our healthcare is a single-payer scheme where people do not have to pay anything outright. It's direct payment between the healthcare foundation and hospital, which means that even if you have not a single euro in your pocket, you can still go to doctor. Many Western European societies operate the systems where you have to pay and then get reimbursed, but that means poor people cannot go to doctor. And even if I am critical of our social system, the way it is, it's the same for everybody. So the basic state security network has to be egalitarian. Then people can take disparities of income and uh, the fact that they may be falling behind. They have to see that absolutely everybody gets the same good or the same bad service. Member of Parliament has to get rubbish health care if a simple person is getting rubbish health care. If Member of Parliament is getting good, the other people have to get it good. This is the only way of uh, making the society to tolerate reform. Yuri Zhitnyak, Kherson, Mykolaiv. I have the question, it's on economics. 
Estonia has become an attractive country for Ukrainian labor migration. But Estonia, uh, does Estonia create some attractive uh, conditions for Ukrainian business that wants to invest into Estonia? Second time today I get discussion and second time I have to answer. Estonia never creates any advantages condition to any business, any capital, any source of capital and nobody. Estonia creates level playing field. Ukrainian capital, Estonian capital, American capital, big, small, nobody gets special treatment. We have a very good economic climate. You can judge by the uh, proportion of uh, tax of our GDP, which is 35. This is such a good economic incentive that nobody could ask for more. And we don't offer anybody any advantages. Everybody is treated equally. This is a major reason why capital has come to the country. Same for the workforce. Actually, we operate quite uh, close to a closed job market uh, outside the European Union, but of course totally open within the European Union. And uh, we are seeing that we are becoming more and more attractive to uh, people coming from elsewhere because our salary levels are quickly rising right now. And indeed, Ukrainians form a big uh, part of uh, this workforce. And uh, we hope that if they are working in Estonia, they are doing it uh, using the legal means and opportunities. Most of them are, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the time is over already, but I would like to inform you that the survey that you have seen today, the survey of the uh, Ukrainian uh, Crisis Media Center and of Estonian Eastern Partnership Center, you will find today on our website and there will be the video there. Summing it up, I would like to say that we all need to, as soon as possible, identify information threats and so-called uh, policy of soft power, which includes religious, historic diplomacy, cultural diplomacy of Russian Federation. And then possibly there will be fewer chances for military scenario. Thank you all. Over there we have coffee. Uh, please treat yourself to some coffee. Thank you.